of his linguistic abilities. Uh, he was fluent in French and English, fully bilingual. He, his Latin was excellent. His ancient Greek was excellent. And he was very competent in German and uh, uh, Italian. As a student, he attended uh, the University of London and the Gregorian uh, University of Rome. And as a professor, he uh, taught at the Immaculate Conception University in Montreal, uh, Regis College in Toronto. He also was a professor at Boston College and Harvard. And final point is his travels. Well, you can say this guy was a modern man. He traveled a great deal. He estimated that he crossed the Atlantic 46 times. And well, he visited, he lived in Rome, Paris, London, Dublin. In North America, he uh, visited uh, New York, Boston, Washington, Los Angeles. And in Canada, he was in Halifax, Montreal, Toronto, and Winnipeg. So a very well-traveled man. So let's begin. Uh, with a quotation from one of my favorite Canadian uh, uh, thinkers, John Ralston Saul. And in August of 2020, in an interview, he made this statement. One of the most important things in society is if you reach a point where the language, which is the mainstream language, bears no relationship to reality, you lost the thing that is the difference between us and animals, if you like, is our ability to talk to each other in a way that makes sense. So I think the point uh, John Ralston Saul is making is that we are we're not talking to each other or we do talk to each other, we're talking about different realities and we just don't understand each other. So um, this could be seen in these uh, uh, elements. So there's certain cognitive tendencies uh, found in our post-truth world. Uh, there's confirmation bias. There's computerized alterations of reality. Uh, we are all embedded in a world of screens and images. Uh, we are being fed images and texts from the internet and social media. And then our leaders institutions are also uh, providing us with information, oftentimes uh, information that we may either not agree with or we just don't understand where they are coming from. And as for post-truth, well, one definition is that it represents the disappearance of shared objective standards in the world. And uh, the Oxford uh, Dictionary has defined it as an adjective. It relates to or denotes circumstances in which the objective facts are less influenced in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. So when we say stuff, we're based, it's based upon our feelings, our emotions, not necessarily upon what is factually correct. So Lonergan, uh, he was also in Europe in the 1920s and 30s. And at that time, he also witnessed a time of, of competing narratives. And in other words, uh, people were given different perspectives of the world and not necessarily these perspectives uh, said the same thing about their lives. So in Insight, he wrote, the tension divides and disorientates, in, disorientates cognitive cognitional activity by the position, by the conflict of positions and counterpositions. This conflict issues into contrary views of the good, which in turn make good will appear misdirected and misdirected will appear good. So Lonergan arrived in Europe, in England in 1926 at the time of the miners' strike. He was there when the stock market crashed in 1929. He returned to Europe in 1933 to Rome and he lived in Rome from 33 to 1940. So he was sitting, you might say, beneath the balcony of Mussolini. And at the same time, Italy invaded Ethiopia, and then we had the Spanish Civil War. So all these events were occurring around him. To continue in that quotation, he makes this statement. There follows the confounding of the social situation with the social third. And this is an important point to explain. So just imagine a country that has a creative minority and a fulfilled majority. 
and the minority, the leaders, and the majority, the people, understand each other. They work together, and everybody's more or less gaining some benefit in the social contract. But time uh, passes on, and this created minority becomes the dominating minority. And the fulfilled majority becomes the unfulfilled majority. So we don't understand each other. There's, um, there's oversights. We misunderstand each other. And in fact, what eventually happens is that it becomes very tense. And whereby uh, we have the dominant majority, the dominating majority, almost name calling the rest of the population and the, uh, the unfulfilled minority name calling the elite. So in other words, one person should be locked up, the other person is crooked. And that creates this social surge. And so what we have are people who are not, who, who are directed by oversights. They're almost irrational in what they believe in. And the other issue that pertains to the minority and majority is that they all believe that they represent the true heritage of the country, but they are at cross purposes with each other. So that creates this uh, social serve with multiple perspectives. So what is insight about? Well, it's knowing how you know. So according to Lonergan, the aim of this work is to convey an insight into insight. It follows that insight into insight is in some sense knowledge of knowledge. Therefore, as not Lonergan states, the point is to discover, to identify, to become familiar with the activities of one's own intelligence. So everyone, the point of this book is not to provide you with a picture of the world, a, uh, a scheme of the world, uh, where you can quote from it and say, according to Lonergan, uh, this means this and that. This is almost like an intellectual self-help book. In other words, this is a book on how to think and how to think metaphysically. So, according to uh, Lonergan believed that really insight would be an exit route from this crisis. But our concern is to reach the act of organizing intelligence that brings into a single perspective the insights of mathematicians, scientists, and men of common sense. There's one thing he wants us to do. We, he would like a mathematician, a scientist, an economist, historian, a sociologist, and a man of common sense to understand each other and understand where each person is coming from. So, we don't just reject the views of a mathematician or a uh, scientist. We actually work together and we understand each other. So that's one purpose of this book. The other book deals with the flight of understanding. So he wrote, insight into the various modes of the flight from understanding will explain the range of really confused yet apparently clear and distinct ideas. Aberrant views on the meaning of meaning and the existence of multiple philosophies. So how do we live in a world with multiple philosophies that are contradictory or contrary to each other? How do we make sense of these multiple views? So he believed that if you read insight and have insight into insight, then that would bring to light the cumulative process of progress. In other words, we know we will know what to do to correct a problem. Similarly, insight into oversight reveals the cumulative process of decline. So if we understand the problem, hopefully we can correct the problem. So that's his goal. That's the point of reading this book. So uh, there's a term authenticity or genuineness in a world of contrary perspectives. So let me explain that. I have genuineness uh, in brackets. In insight, his book, he uses the word genuine. But later in his career, after he started reading Heidegger, uh, he used the word authenticity. Now, a genuine, he doesn't mean sincere, lack of pretense, being a nice person. He means something more than that. And for authenticity, he, do he doesn't mean narcissism. So in other words, uh, 
subjectivity, excessive or un, uncontrolled subjectivity, uh, etc. So this is what he's hoping we could do. How is the mind to become conscious of its own bias when that bias springs from a communal flight from understanding and, and is supported by the whole texture of a civilization? Or how can human intelligence hope to deal with the unintelligible yet objective situations which the flight from understanding creates and expands and sustains? So if we happen to be living in the midst of that social third, how do we make sense of that world? So in this cartoon, have I got time for a cup of coffee? Well, who's really right here? Is the world coming to the end? Or should I just relax and have a cup of coffee? Because there's really, pal, what are you talking about? The world looks fine to me. Oh, Lonergan divides this book up uh, in three parts according by three questions. What am I doing when I am knowing? That deals with cognition. Why is doing that knowing? That's epistemology. And then finally, what do I know when I do it? That's metaphysics. So, cognition. What am I doing when I am knowing? In a cartoon, what's the matter with you, pal? I'm looking for my checkbook. So do you really know what you're doing when you're looking? So oh, this is a uh, issue that Lonergan has been dealing with, was dealing with continuously in his books, looking and knowing. So when we are looking, do we know? Is having to look the same thing as understanding? So simple questions, but that those questions are the basis of his uh, philosophy and the answers that he came up with. So I guess what you would say uh, to someone when you see a dog, you can say the same thing to an alligator. Then there's the other issues, the bridge, the validation. If we have experiential sensations, if we have sensate data, how do we get the concept, the theory? Where does that come from? And if we have the concept and theory, how do we really know that that concept or theory is true? Have we checked it? Have we tested it? Have we uh, debated that in our mind to see whether that truth, that uh, is correct. So this is, this is chapters one to 10. And uh, what, if you read chapters one to 10, you go through a series of exercises where you come to understand the meaning of insight. So just go through this quickly. Uh, we have experiences that are given to our consciousness. And well, we're driven by the spirit of human inquiry. In the process, we collect data and we ask these questions, who, when, where? And then we might have an image and we'll have this question, what is the nature of, why is this so? Why? And then there might be clues. And if we have a good teacher or parent or so on and friend, that person might nudge us along and might provide us with a few suggestions, not explicitly, but may see, they'll give us a cue. And then we have insight. That's when the mind grasps the intelligible uh, between the between things that seem disconnected. So that's, according to Lonergan, insight is the bridge between uh, sensate data and the concept. Then we express an abstract generality, a concept. Then we reflect upon it. We weigh the evidence. And in the end, we make a judgment. We'll say, yep, this is true or no. You know, this theory you have, this formula, it just doesn't work. Go back to school. So if you look at the cartoon, uh, these two guys are uh, depicting insight. So the guy wants a job as an accountant. And so, well, a good accountant juggles the numbers. But he's not going to say that. He's not going to say, I'm going to jungle the numbers. He's just going to throw balls up in the air. And... And the, uh, the employer gets it, he gets the point. He's not gonna ask him, are you good at juggling numbers? Um, that's illegal. He just looks at him, he thinks, yep, he can juggle numbers, I'll hire him. So that's insight. So in another way, uh, 
we have a general structure of the cognitional process. So we have presentations, we have a level of intelligence, and then there's a level of reflection. So everyone, that's chapters one to 10. Let's move on to tonight's topic, which is epistemology. And it's, what is truth? You expect me to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you ask me a question like that? Like normally, I would just lie. Oh, the question that Lonergan asks is, why is doing that knowing? In other words, how do we know what we know is true? Well, I think with these three guys, maybe they should have brought a tape measure when they went fishing, because then they would have a good idea how big the fish was. So as humans, and this is chapter 11, you'll see numbers in the corner. This is chapter 11. As Lonergan puts it, I am a knower. Now that seems a bit odd, but well, if you just look at, um, think about Aristotle, Aristotle would say that wonder is the basis of philosophy and uh, science. And St. Thomas Aquinas would say that uh, there is a natural desire amongst all humans to know God. So uh, Lonergan begins by saying that we are knowers. And we're not just knowers in a simple way that I know how to drive a car. We are a concrete, intelligible, unity, identity holes. Now this is very important. Uh, because we should see ourselves as people who experience, understand, and judge, and make judgments, not separately. I don't just experience things and sense them, and then later on I come up with a formula, and then afterwards I judge. All that's done as a unity, as an identity, as a whole. So that's his point. Now, if you look at the cartoon, now what? There's nothing else to invent. Okay, so they got wheels, they got a wagon, but you know what? If you think about human history, people got to know a lot more than just a little wagon. They invented far more inventions. So you can say that humans are knowers. Well, there's a number of things that differentiate Lonergan from other philosophers. So the traditional epistemological approach uh, uh, went this way. There's a separation of knowing subjects and known objects. There must be a correspondence between what is in the mind and what is out there. And then the underlying assumption is that perceiving or looking is knowing. In other words, there's this confrontation. So this is uh, uh, underlines Descartes, Locke, Hume, and even uh, Kant. So there's a dualistic understanding of the world. In Lonergan's approach, uh, he believes that correct knowing occurs when a knower is self-appropriated, that is objectified. So when the knower is both the subject and the object. So we become the object, just like the computer is sitting in front of me is an object. And there is identity between you, the knower, making yourself known, and you to know are engaging in these three united cognitive activities. So we are engaged in these three cognitive activities and we see ourselves, we objectify ourselves, while at the same time, we look at the world around us. So you can see what Lonergan takes is an intellectualist approach to knowledge rather than a conceptualist approach to knowledge. So, Self-appropriation, that's, that's when I know that I am a knower. So we present ourselves, we are present in ourselves, we take possession of ourselves as a subject, we are conscious of ourselves, conscious of our consciousness when engagement occurs during the three levels of cognitive, cognitional activity. So that's when I might ask somebody this question. Do you know what that means? Do you know what it means to have a mind of your own? Is that just a phrase that you're stating or is that something you really believe and you do you really, do you really believe it? Do you know what it is to suffer? Do you really know? You talk about it, but I don't know whether you truly believe in it. Do you know what it means to respect others? You say you do, but explain it. So 
you know, Ka uh, Descartes says, I think, I there therefore I am. Well, you can put a twist on this. You can say, I know, therefore I know I am a knower. So you can look at it uh, that way. So, uh, Monaghan is not just, is, he's not a confrontationalist, he's an intellectualist. And there's not a point that differentiates him from uh, philosophers from the past. Being oneself is being, and by being is not meant the abstract, but the concrete. It is not the universal, universal concept, not nothing of, of Scotus, the medieval philosopher and Hegel, but the concrete goal in all inquiry and reflection. So what Lonergan is saying is that, let's get away from abstractions when it comes to defining what is being. And he would say that a lot of these abstractions mean nothing. And as a student, uh, as a young Jesuit studying uh, Aquinas and so on, these abstractions meant nothing to him. They were alien to them, to him, and he kept looking for something else. So instead of a concept, Lonergan would suggest that we understand being as a notion. So notion is an inclination, an impulse, or an intention, or intentionality. So being is in a state of intentionality where we intend to keep doing things. So first of all, being is the objective of the pure desire to know. So I really want to know uh, about the world. And I therefore, uh, when I know the world, I will know being. At the same time, let's move on. The affirmation in hand is that there is this a pure desire to know, an inquiry and critical spirit, that follows up questions with further questions that heads for some objective which has been named being. So I keep moving to outwards into the world, wanting to know more and more. And by knowing more, I also have a better sense of being. In other words, I have a better sense of what is true in the world. Now there's another point to this, but the pure desire to know is the notion of being as it is spontaneously operative in cognitional process. And being itself is to be known towards which the process heads. So everyone, it's two things. Uh, it's transcendent in one way that I keep moving away from myself to understand the world, but it's also transcendental in that I'm moving into myself and I'm learning more about myself. Characteristics of the notion of being, they include all the things that we discover, invent, or know. And most importantly, uh, probably the most important point is the types of questions that we ask. In fact, questions, good questions, are more important than just the content that we have. And spontane and being is spontaneous. It's common to all men and women, and it's an intentionality. We just keep wanting to learn more and more and more. And it's all pervasive. It underpins all cognitional contents and penetrates all conditional contents. So this guy in the cartoon, I like a man who knows where he's going. Well, this is a man who uh, lives by this quality of being. He's moving outwards in the world. He, he's wanting to know more about the world, but at the same time, he is acquiring self-knowledge of himself. So connected to this notion of being is also meaning. Because, well, what's the point of learning something if it doesn't mean anything? So there has to be some meaning to what you learn. As the notion of being underpins all contents and penetrates them and constitutes them as cognitional, so also it is the core of meaning. So when we learn about something, we will learn about something that has meaning. Now, the all-inclusive term of meaning is being, for apart from being, there is nothing. So everyone, uh, in either there's being, a reality, or there's nothing in the world. Inversely, the core acts of all meaning is the intention of being. So when we have this intentionality of wanting to learn, we are also wanting to learn more about what is meaningful in the world. 
Now, uh, thus, any given judgment pertains to a context of judgments, and it is from the context that the meaning of the given judgment is determined. So uh, our place in society, our place in the world, our place in history, uh, the context will de also determine what is meaningful in a particular society. So uh, after 12, where he looks at uh, the importance of meaning. Chapter 13 is where he looks at the notion of objectivity. Now again, objectivity is a notion. So that means that we are inclined, there's an impulse, there's an intention to find objectivity. In other words, something that will tell us that what we believe is true is definitely correct. So uh, objectivity is grounded in the fidelity to the pure desire to know. So it demands original attention to the it demands attention to the original data. It calls for rigorous questioning. It seeks accurate, accurate insights. It develops a hypothesis. It urges questions for reflection. It presides over the weighing of evidence. It ensures a valid judgment, and we have knowledge. Now I'm going to go through all these points again because that's quite a bit. So the key point in uh, his understanding of objectivity is the third part of his cognitive structure, which is judgment or the act of judgment. That's when we ask this question, is it so? Uh, is it so? Is it true? So the act of judgment is the act that adds assent to a proposition, that changes a proposition from an expression of an object of thought, an expression of some bright idea that comes into your mind into an object of affirmation. So in high school, students are asked to write an essay. So they will be asked to develop a hypothesis, they will find the evidence, and then in the end, they will have their thesis. And then they write their essay. So uh, we look at this in greater detail, we may have an assertion or a hypothesis or the conditioned. In other words, you're saying this, but what are the conditions of it? What makes it true? So we're gonna ask this question, what it, is it true? Is it so? So we have to come up with proof, supporting evidence, and we have to weigh the evidence. And just as there was insight at the beginning of this process, where we connected sensate data to the concept, there's now insight that will connect the, sense, the, the concept to judgment, to knowledge. So we will have reflective insight. So we're looking at the evidence and we'll think to ourselves, you know what, all this adds up. This is probably right. I think this is correct. And so that's when you would say we have, uh, the condition has now become the virtually unconditioned. So we will have an act of judgment and I'll say to my high school teacher, uh, Mr. Smithens, I think I got it all uh, correct. And, uh, I think uh, I can make, uh, I can write a good essay to demonstrate my point. And he will look at my points and he'll say, sure, I think it looks, it looks fine. Write the essay and let's see how you do with your English. So um, that's what he's talking about. Now, I just wanna explore this concept of the, uh, the virtually unconditioned. And one way of looking at that is by comparing it to the legal concept of proof beyond reasonable doubt. So we may have 0% certainty of, of an assertion, or we can have 100% uh, certainty of an assertion. In other words, is that person, I'm gonna charge this person with murder. Is that person guilty or not? There's no evidence. So there's 0% certainty. Now, if we have civil cases, let's say I want to sue somebody for uh, assault or whatever, then in court, all we need is just a balance of probabilities, the preponderance of the, of the evidence. In other words, we can say, more than likely, uh, this guy did this to me. More than likely, he committed fraud. fraud. Probably he committed fraud. For Lonergan, that's not good enough. You just can't say, more than likely, this is true. What you need is proof beyond reasonable doubt. In other words, absolute assurance that this statement is correct. 
Now, he uses the word virtually unconditioned. The reason why it's not 100% certain is because, well, as a priest, he was saying, the only thing that is uh, unconditioned is God. So anything less than God is going to be virtually unconditioned. In other words, it might be 99% true, but that's about all we can do with it. So uh, there's a triple chord of objectivity. So uh, he would say that there's experiential objectivity. That's when we have the intelligent selection of relevant data. Then there's normative objectivity. That's where we have a disinterested, detached, and unrestricted desire to know. And that adds up to absolute objectivity. That's when uh, the virtually unconditioned is grass. That's when the hypothesis is true. So uh, that would be his idea of objectivity. Now that doesn't seem much like much, but uh, Lonergan was a man of his age in the sense that when he published his book, Insight, uh, he had to listen to his editors, the publishers. Uh, he had to make corrections and the book had to be peer reviewed. And in later life, as a, uh, as a guy who published other, another book and articles, all of that was peer reviewed. So uh, to share objectivity. So what all this leads to is intellectual conversion. In other words, critical realism. And this is where he stands as a critical realist. Knowing accordingly is not just seeing, it is experiencing, understanding, judging, and believing. The criteria of objectivity are not just the criteria of ocular vision. They are the compounded criteria of experiencing, of understanding, of judging, and believing. So this is what a critical realist does. It's a rejection of the picture world as a source of knowledge. So he's saying that uh, John Locke and, and Hume, you guys got a good point. It's very important to work with the sensate world, but looking uh, does not create objective knowledge. And he would say that uh, Kant is a really smart idea, I get a real smart guy, but sense, uh, intuitive sense this only creates appearance, which is a phenomenal, which is phenomenal knowledge, but it's not true reality. And rationalists like Descartes, well, they are very good at uh, deciding whether their assertion is true or not, but they also have to uh, deal with the material world where the uh, idea is placed onto empirical reality. And in the end, even Descartes has to look. So Lonergan believes that uh, knowledge is not just looking. It involves those three stages of experiencing, understanding, and judging. And then when we judge and we say it is true, at that time, we can say that we understand uh, what is true and that this is true. Well, let's move on, metaphysics. This is uh, his next uh, section. So we asked the question, what is reality? These guys here, they must be in the middle of nowhere because that's what the signs say. What do I know when I do it? According to this painter, I think he's trying to tell us he can't paint. So Math, uh, Lonergan defines metaphysics in this way. It is a unification and organization of what is known in math and science and by common sense is metaphysics. Hence, in the measure that insight unifies and organize all our knowing, it, is, it will imply a metaphysics. So anyone, it doesn't have to be math, science, uh, but it should include common sense. It could include uh, history, it could include psychology, and it could and will include common sense. So it's cutting, it's, it's connecting the dots between one uh, uh, department of knowledge to another. He says there are three stages of metaphysics. There's a latent stage, stage, there's latent metaphysics. 
So that's when a young a boy or girl will start asking questions. Why is this the case? Uh, Daddy, mommy, can you tell me why this is happening? And then there's problematic uh, metaphysics. That's when this person gets older. He's still asking questions, but he needs help to help connect the dots. And then there's explicit metaphysics. That's when you anticipate the future of understanding and its conceptualization, and it uses that anticipation to guide the process towards attaining the act of understanding. So you want, again, metaphysics is a notion. It's an inclination, impulse, or intention. In other words, we are driven to, we're trying to make sense of the world, connect the dots, draw the lines, etc. This little boy, uh, he could be uh, between latent and problematic metaphysics. So how come God put all the vitamins in cabbage and nothing in candy? So he's asking the priest, how is that, why is that the case? So maybe uh, this boy is in the stage of problematic metaphysics. So explicit metaphysics, everyone, is an anticipation. It is a subject achieving self-appropriation, in other words, knowing yourself as a knower and using that knowledge to determine the general structure of its possible object and the relations between the particular departments in knowing that object. So explicit metaphysics is concerned with anticipating the structure of knowledge when it's at the stage of an completion. In other words, I'm getting myself geared up, ready to learn what's next. So everyone, metaphysics is a pedagogy. And this book is, in a sense, a self-help book. So if you read Lonegan's book, and if you, uh, you will learn this. Metaphysics, then, is not something in a book, but something in a mind. Moreover, it is produced not by a book, but only by the mind in which it is. No one can understand for another or judge for another. Such acts are one's own and only one's own. Explicit metaphysics is a personal attainment. So what this book about is this. Lonergan wants us to think. He wants us to think well. He wants us to connect the world, make sense of the world. In this cartoon, listen, there's nothing wrong with being ambitious. Well, this guy is probably uh, uh, thinking ahead. And uh, he is driven by an intention, and he does want to become the boss in the firm. That's his goal. So, uh, Metaphysics, chapter 15 of his book, he puts together a structure. And in a sense, it's, he, I didn't use the term, but it's called a heuristic structure of proportionate being. So simplify it, it's a, it's a method, it's a, a system by which we uh, uh, continue to pursue knowledge of ourselves and the world. So he borrows from uh, St. Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle these terms, potency, form, and act. So potency is the unexamined experiential data. Form is relations between things that need to be understood. And act is the unuttered, uttered, virtually unconditioned of reasonable judgment. So let's look at this cartoon. We have this one guy who has uh, looked like a weapon of mass destruction and another guy with a small club. And so, uh, you can say that the uh, potency is the, uh, the possible use of this weapon of mass destruction. The form could perhaps be this. Let's see what happens when the enemy attacks us, the neighboring tribe attacks us. And so uh, should we take out our weapon of mass destruction or not? Should we have it on hand? Should we display it? And then the act, well, should we, we will decide in the end. The enemy is attacking us with just small clubs. Should we take out this big club? Probably not. You know, arms races are quite destructive. Who, who knows where this will lead to next? We may end up destroying the whole world. So we're gonna put this big club aside and we're just gonna fight with small clubs. This way to work, we all survive in a sense. 
Then he adds two additional elements to his structure. Uh, he comes up, he works through these terms of things, substance, reality, and he calls it what is central. In other words, what is what something is in its concrete state. It's the defining qualities of that thing. And then he looks at he different. Then he looks at body, action, appearance, or what is conjugate. In other words, it's characteristics associated with a thing, but not central to a thing. Well, let's look at this cartoon. My kid drew them on my passport picture with a magic marker. Now, if we look at what is central, I would say that uh, to be a human being, a male, uh, having mouse ears is not central to his essence, to what he is as a human. But we should ask this little boy or girl uh, what he or she thinks is central to his or her father. Maybe the guy is a mouse. And maybe that's, his, uh, that's the main characteristic of this guy. He's a mousy guy. So we have to ask other people, uh, what do you think is the defining characteristic? Is it mouse ears or not? So we have to talk. Lonergan, in the end, holds together this structure of explicit metaphysics. Now, again, everybody, uh, this is ongoing. This is dynamic. It's moving. It's something that's not static. It's, you might say, it's like a toolkit. So this way, uh, we can understand the world. Just one second, everyone. So uh, what he does on the left-hand side is present us with his uh, psychology. And he equates that with his metaphysical uh, toolkit, his system. And so uh, what is potentially intelligible, that's potency, what is formally intelligible, that's form, and uh, what is actually intelligible, that's the act. Now there's a lot to go through, the, through with this, but let's put it this way. This is an example of directed dynamism. So in other words, potency presupposes or complements the form. And then form presupposes or complements the act. And uh, it just keeps moving on and on. Now at the bottom, I have three questions. What is family? What is nationality? And what is space and time? What well, Lonergan would say that if we want to learn something. We should begin with something a person knows, a person's, what a person is interested in. So if I was teaching this in a classroom, rather than just lecturing about it, I would uh, put students together in groups and I would begin by asking them this question, what is family? Uh, and tell me what are the different characteristics of a family? And I would have a variety of kids in the classroom and they will provide me what they think is the family. But we all know that the nature of the family changes in time. And so the, what is potentially intelligible, formally intelligible, and actually intelligible may change when uh, we have two people united in marriage, and then afterwards when these two people have children. And then it changes again when there's several children, it changes again when someone, when the couple adopts a child. It changes again when uh, the children marry, etc. So our understanding of the world is ongoing. Now, the next point is nationality. Again, if I was in a class, I would say, all right, you guys and girls know what a family is. Let's move on and ask this question, what is nationality? And how does one define nationality over a period of time? Is it just the original settlers to a country? Is it uh, uh, is nationality defined by citizenship and by uh, uh, adhering to the law? So once students understand that, then I will move on to something more philosophical, space and time. So. Uh, Perhaps one way of understanding being and being of the world around us and being within ourselves is perhaps ask this question, what is family? So who am I in this 
unit in this house. And then who am I in this country? And who am I in this universe? So we're moving from something that's very familiar to us and concrete to something that's very abstract. So we're layering on top of each other one uh, set of ideas onto another, and we keep spreading out like a spider's web, farther and farther away from us, understanding the nature of the world. So anyways, uh, this is something that we leave for discussion. So chapter 16, and I'm just going to summarize it very quickly, uh, quickly because it's quite in depth. Uh, our purpose is not to write a treatise on metaphysics, but to reveal in concrete fashion the existence and power of a method. If the method is both valid and powerful, the treatise will follow in due course. In other words, if you read my book, are you going to be thinking? Are you going to be thinking metaphysically? That's what he's uh, doing. And well, he wrote this book between 1947 and 53, right after the Second World War. But the plain fact is the world lies in pieces before him and pleased to be put together on the strong ground of the possibility of questioning and with the full awareness of the range of possible answers. So uh, he's looking or he's hoping that people will be able to put the world together and make sense of the world, especially after World War II and the fact that people are in in, in the midst of a cold war. So that's what essentially chapter 16 is all about. Chapter 17, uh, metaphysics as dialectic. So this is where he actually works through that structure that was given several frames ago. And one of the things he deals with is myth. In fact, he looks at myth and history in this chapter. Mythic consciousness experiences and imagines, understands and judges, but it does not distinguish between these activities. And so it is incapable of guiding itself by the rule that the impalpable, impalpable act of rational assent is a necessary and sufficient condition for knowledge of reality. So he goes into detail as to why myth does not represent knowledge. In fact, myth is uh, a, a confusion of, of experiencing and imagining, understanding and judging. It's a confusion. And then there's the other point. Remember, uh, Lonergan uh, was in Europe before the war. In fact, he was taken out of Italy, I think eight days before Italy invaded France in 1940. He returned to Quebec uh, under the rule of Maurice Duplessis. And Duplessis had the experience of being Canada's little authoritarian premier, our little Mussolini. Uh, and so uh, this is the world he returned to. And this is what he was concerned with. Power in its highest form is power over men. And the successful, successful maker of myths has the power within his reach and grasp. So he really feared the power of people, who, the power people might have to create myths and then so we have power over others around them. So he's actually thinking of Mussolini, he's thinking about Franco, Salazar, Hitler, Duplessis. So what he was afraid of is that people will mix up a myth with reality. And then they would be swayed, taken under control by a charismatic leader who will have authoritarian instincts. And well, I should say it this way, uh, Lonergan, you might say, is an anti-totalitarian thinker. He, he does not believe, he defies the totalitarian state of mind. And he wants us to be independent of a totalitarian state of mind. So that's more or less a book. And that's obvious five after eight. It's almost near the end of this presentation. But I just want to conclude on a number of things. At the beginning, I stated that uh, one purpose of his book was to uh, encourage people to uh, be cross-disciplinary. In other words, be a, a person of good common sense 
be a good mathematician and be a good scientist. So in my uh, rummaging around through the internet, I found this. At the University of Massachusetts uh, Medical School, in the Graduate School of Nursing, in the PhD program, uh, their pro uh, program is guided by the cognitive philosophy of Vonnegut. So if you look at the second paragraph, everyone, the focus of the University of Michigan Med uh, Medical School program is on the development and transformation of scholars who will lead the discipline of nursing. Our program is influenced by the cognitive philosophy of Bernard Vonnegut. We welcome students to engage in a transformative process of wonder and discovery, self-reflection, critical thinking, and genuine dialogue with other students and faculty. So I looked up this graduate program. I looked at their course of study or their, the courses that the students need to take. They didn't mention Lonergan, but there is a, a course on philosophy, but they have integrated Lonergan's theories into the graduate program at this particular school. And as for this particular school, uh, I think last year uh, it was rated 10th in the United States in uh, for primary care. It's a 10th best school for primary care and 45th best school in terms of research. It is a public institution. Uh, it's, a pu it's a public university. It's not a Catholic university. It's a secular school. Well, I did a little more digging. And you know what? There's an epistemology of nursing. And I found actually about nine articles pertaining to Lonergan and healthcare. I find this actually quite relevant uh, now, given the, uh, the pandemic we are in. So one professor, uh, Donna J. Perry, in her article, Self-Transcendence, Lonergan's Key to Integration of Nursing Theory, Research and Practice, wrote, an epistemology of nursing wisdom would include the practical, the theoretical, and the, and the scientific integrated into a whole that is consistent with universal truth and the moral order. The best way to unify nursing theory, science, and practice is to integrate them within each nurse. So one goal is to get nurses, and again, these are graduate nurses, a graduate school nurses, to be thinking in a multidisciplinary way. So I, let's say in terms of this crisis right now, the nurse might be thinking about uh, epidemiology, a nurse may be thinking about social work, and a nurse may be thinking about looking after that patient uh, on that bed with the ventilator. So th that's a one thing that uh, comes to mind. Then in another article by another uh, faculty member, and Kane, and it's titled, Lonergan's philosophy as a grounding for cross-disciplinary research. His ideas offer a common ground to nurses and all researchers facing challenges and cross-philosophical divides among disciplines and their research traditions. So what she wants is nurses to engage in, in research, to understand scientific theory, and to have that information. Oh, I'm sorry, let me rephrase it. She wants nurses to be able to work with others in other disciplines. So in other words, uh, she's not just only good at looking after the patients, but she can talk to people in other fields of study and work with them and share information. In other words, to be a true leader in health, you should have a good sense of your work on a, on a daily basis, and you should have a good idea of what other people are thinking. You should have a good idea of their theories. So she wants people, these two uh, professors want their graduates to be within themselves in a sense of being uh, multidisciplinary and also with a sense of being uh, moving outwards to know what a social worker does, what a police officer does, the other night on Steve Pakin's agenda program, he was talking about this pandemic and he uh, talk, was talking to a person who is uh, in charge of the Chamber of Commerce for Ontario and uh, a nurse, I believe, and a third person. And what came to mind in all of this was that all these people are now forced to work with each other. 
and understand where each person is coming from. And if we don't understand each other in this crisis, we're in big trouble. The other point is still the issue of objectivity in our world. So um, you can say objectivity has fruit decay. So what the nurses at the University of Massachusetts are doing seems to be the right thing to do. But still, we are living in this larger world. US-based journalism has gradually shifted away from objective news and offers more opinion-based content that appeals to emotion and relies heavily on argumentation and advocacy according to the new RAND Corporation report. Now that was in 2019. CBC just ran a series of specials called Big News. Uh, this is the air in, a, in, in one person, according to one person, Richard Edelman, which CBC interviewed, he stated, this is the era of information bankruptcy. Women lied to by those in charge and the media sources are seen as politicized and biased. The result is a lack of quality information and increased divisiveness. So we're still stuck in this post-truth world. We're still stuck in this world of, of multiple perspectives that are at odds with each other. So how do we get out of this? So Lonergan brings forward uh, his transcendental precepts. And you might say this is a short form for what was said in these 800 pages, but actually it means more. So what Lonergan is suggesting is that we be attentive. In other words, we know is what is so. We respect all data as possibly intelligible. When we ask these questions, who, when, where? So just because someone fact checks, that's not good enough. We have to move beyond just fact checking. We have to be intelligent. We have to know the difference between getting a point and missing it. We have to ask these questions, what, how, why? In other words, how do these things fit together, unify? So again, we have all these fact checkers out, but still, how do we connect the dots? And then be reasonable. Now, this is where we judge. There's the act. Uh, that's when we know, that's when we have being, and then there's reality. Be realistic, not a dreamer. Check theory, ask the question, is this really true? Is this real? Weigh the evidence and grasp the reflective insight to give us uh, assent. So in the end, you'll say, you know what, this, uh, this, this is probably true. These people were right, or these people were wrong for these reasons. And you have to give a reason. You just can't say, yep, it's okay with me, because that's just no good, that's not good enough. And then uh, Lonergan expanded on his ideas and this fourth point is really taken from his other book, A Method in Theology, but I included it in this point. Be responsible, be and do good. Ask this question, shall I decide accordingly? Is this a value? In other words, once you have this knowledge, what are you gonna do with it? Are you just gonna sit in your room and keep it to yourself? Or are you gonna go out and do something with it? So that's what he wants people to do. And he wants people to uh, go outwards into the world and act according to what they have learned, not just to say, yep, that's pretty bad. That uh, leader is not a good guy. And then just sit in front of a TV set and watch more TV news. So the last slide is exit room. The fruit of authenticity. And this is the question that I had at the beginning. What is authenticity? So we move, and again, this is this, this third collection uh, is, comes from uh, an article he wrote in the early 1970s. The fruit of authenticity is decline. There is no use appealing to the sense of responsibility of irresponsible people, to the reasonableness of, reasonableness of people that are unreasonable, to the intelligence of people that have chosen to be obtuse, to the attention of people that attend only to their grievances. So what do you do with people who are irresponsible, unreasonable, obtuse, and are always grieving, talking about their problems? And so his answer is this, 
However, beyond progress and decline, there is redemption. Its principle is self-sacrificing love. In the measure that the community becomes a community of love, it can wipe out the grievances and correct the objective absurdities that its, antes, uh, that its antesticity has brought about. So it means doing good to others, whether you are an individual person or uh, a person of power in government. And so that's his suggestion as to how we can get out of this uh, mess of the social surge. And that, everyone, is Lonergan in actually one hour.